So welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for attending the certificate in open pedagogy, formerly open educational practices information session. This will technically be our third cohort. Um, and with that, we will get started today. We're going to talk a little bit um, about who is OEN, the, the folks hosting this and whom I work for. We're going to talk about the program itself, a uh, description, background, component, outcomes, um, costs, of course. And then you're going to hear from two of our instructors. Uh, you'll get a couple of, or actually three, I think, alumni testimonials, and then any and all questions you'll have a chance uh, to ask. So thank you for being here. Um, so who are we? Who is OEN? So just a little bit more information about the Open Education Network and who exactly is in our network uh, and our goals and values. We are not a vendor. We are a diverse network of higher ed institutions working together to make higher education more affordable, equitable, and accessible. We represent over 1,800 member campuses across the United States, Canada, Australia, and the UK who strive to make higher ed more open. Specifically, uh, we are focused on action that advances open education in ways that are shareable, collaborative, and sustainable. And we do this by sharing the experiences and expertise of our community in ways to support our members. As a community, we are working together to help everyone in higher education. And the best example of our efforts to support the common good is the Open Textbook Library, which you might be familiar with a comprehensive library of open textbooks reviewed by faculty that make open textbooks freely available to anyone, anywhere, anytime. Um, ultimately, we are thinking of and trying to address something even bigger, and that is the advancement of educational equity through resources and practices that are more affordable, more accessible, and more inclusive. And that's a great segue into this program's description. By the way, if you've just joined us, uh, this is the Certificate in Open Pedagogy Information Session. We're glad you're here. Thank you for being here. Um, so the Certificate in Open Pedagogy uh, is a year-long professional development program that will create open education program leaders who want to be stewards and advocates for open educational resources and its associated practices and pedagogies. Oops. Sorry. Um, so some background. Uh, this was originally funded by a Lori, Laura Bush 21st Century Librarian Program Grant um, from IMLS in 2022. Uh, it's for faculty, librarians, instructional designers, and other faculty adjacent roles. Uh, it is entering its third cohort. It offers formal training, a community of peers, and expert mentors. Uh, we seek to build sustainable, collaborative, and effective open ed programs. And the time commitment is four to six hours per week. The actual components of the program, um, it begins with a nine week online course beginning in January of 2025. Uh, it, somewhat culminates or peaks uh, during the Open Pedagogy Project Symposium. Um, and the culminating project is an action plan that lays out your Open Pedagogy Project. So basically the idea is a team of faculty plus could be a librarian, could be an instructional designer, come together, they target a piece of curriculum that the faculty thinks could be better, could be improved, um, and they revise it through the power of open pedagogy. Um, and so during that uh, symposium, they basically tell us what they've been working on for the past nine to 12 weeks, because there's a gap between the online course and the project symposium. So people can kind of work on finalizing that action plan. Could be a lesson plan, could be a unit, um, could be a syllabus. Um, but the idea is to co-create something through open pedagogy with the power of working with your students. Um, and we lay all of that out in the, the course and you're working on it um, side, you know, side by side with your partner, kind of chunking out um, 
um, the project itself. So some of our learning outcomes, uh, we hope that you will gain fluency in defining open education, including its core benefits, challenges, and potential. Identify the possible intersections of open pedagogy and social justice. The whole program was very thoughtfully built upon a social justice framework uh, from Sarah Lambert. You will design and build sustainable open education programming based on local considerations, culture, strategic alignment, and goals. You'll be thinking about your situation, your institution, your classroom. You'll consider student agency, culturally relevant pedagogy, copyright and licensing, universal design for learning, and accessibility when redesigning your curricular unit or lesson. Um, you'll connect and collaborate with other open educational advocates dedicated to developing accessible and inclusive learning environments across the country, perhaps the world, and you will create a unique plan to transform student learning through the use of open pedagogy that is centered in social justice. Uh, so you start with a nine-week course, you have the symposium where you share with the whole cohort, cohort and then in the spring, um, ideally, you actually implement that revised curriculum. Um, and then what are the program costs uh, for 2025? So up to this point, IMLS has paid. Thank you, IMLS. Um, the grant is now complete. Um, and so we do need to charge something just to cover our costs. So OEN member institutions pay 770. Consortial institutions pay 1060, non-members pay 1350, and there is financial assistance available. Uh, financial assistance uh, involves asking a colleague or supervisor uh, to send a letter on your behalf saying, yes, we are strapped, this financial assistance is needed, and this person would be a great addition to the program. Um, so that uh, financial assistance brings the cost down to $430. Uh, up to this point, we've been able to meet all of the requests that have come in. Um, and so every year, you know, we just don't know how many requests will come in and how many will be paying members. Uh, so I can't speak to that. I'll just say that up to this point in our other program, the Certificate in Open Ed Librarianship, we have been able to meet uh, requests for partial financial assistance. Oops, and that's what I was supposed to uh, have clicked on. Yeah, letter of support, explaining financial need. And I'm sorry for the, the error, it's actually 430, not 420. Um, and new this year, um, librarians and instructional designers who have successfully completed the program can take additional paying faculty through the program later at no additional cost. So up until this point, only librarians and faculty have completed it. So if any of those librarians would like to come back, uh, they are welcome back as many times as they want to come with a paying faculty member. Um, and so as of this year, because it is not IML is funded anymore, we're inviting other adjacent faculty roles who can support faculty in the redesign of curriculum, like instructional designers or others um, who might uh, feel that they're able to do that. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about some of the benefits. Um, you experience connections with practitioners all over the nation and potentially world. Um, you have a partnership that provides time to collaborate. And again and again, um, from our participants, we heard that that was the secret sauce, was actually being given time to think about curriculum with, um, with a partner and, and having someone to assist you in that journey. Uh, you will be formulating an action plan that provides a robust template of next steps for revision. Uh, so far, when we've asked in every single survey that we've asked, um, will you be using open pedagogy? Again, 100% of respondents have said, yes, I want to do this again. It, it works. You will be provided with examples, best practices, and resource, resources and a course shell that you can retain access to for up to two years. Um, and also, I will be putting out, um, again, a public version of the shell that you can access for free. 
Um, and then you will also get a certificate, a digital certificate with 60 um, continuing edit ed units in case that's of interest to you. I've been asked for it over the years and finally um, we received approval for that. So if you're interested, uh, how do you apply? What, what are the criteria for application? Uh, you need to answer some questions about your role in institution. You need to upload a resume or a CV that reflects interest in open education and or open pedagogy. That doesn't mean that you have to have experience in either of those, but that you have interest in it. Um, I'm always asked every year, how long should the CV or resume be? There is no limit, but two uh, pages is recommended. Um, you will be answering some questions about the synergy between open education and social justice, uh, your thoughts on the matter. And then you're gonna be asked to reflect upon how your participation in this program may positively impact diversity, equity, and inclusion um, at your own institution and in your own classroom. Um, I'd like to show you the instructors for uh, beginning in January of 2025, myself, Heather Maselli from AACNU, David Tully from North Carolina State University Libraries, and Melissa Williams from Minnesota State. Um, so that's who that's your instructional lineup for this year. Um, and I'm sorry for talking so much at you. Um, I'm going to turn it over to um, Heather, who was in from the very beginning, uh, was one of the initial instructors who actually got the grant. Uh, at Roger Williams University and uh, reached out to us to partner with us. So she's been in it from the very beginning. So I will turn it over to Heather. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Welcome. So glad to see all of you here today. Um, as Tanya said, my name is Heather Maselli. I currently work for the American Association of Colleges and Universities, where I'm a postdoc research fellow working on a Hewlett funded research grant on OER effectiveness and impact on student um, success. Um, but prior to this, I was a faculty member at Roger Williams University. Um, for most of the time, I was an adjunct faculty member. Um, and I that's where my OER um, interest was born. Uh, I applied for an OER faculty fellowship um, with my colleague, Lindsay Gavush, um, who was our librarian. She was our scholarly communications librarian. And in that work, um, I developed uh, the open, the sorry, the Core 101 Open Pedagogy Project, which was a series of websites that my non-majors science students created um, that served as a textbook from semester to semester. Um, so I am a practitioner in open pedagogy. Um, that was my perspective that I brought to the grant and to the curriculum development in this program. Um, but what really was important about the Core 101 Open Pedagogy Project and when we started talking about applying for an IMLS grant was that partnership between faculty and librarians. Uh, I wouldn't have been able to do half of the work that I did um, without the help of Lindsay. Um, and so we decided when we applied for the IMLS grant that we were going to develop this program as a partnership. Um, it, is at a, it is a librarian or now an instructional designer or some other faculty adjacent role and um, the faculty member um, so many faculty members, like myself as contingent faculty, sometimes are isolated. They don't always have people to bounce ideas off of. Open is not as widespread as we would hope it would be. Um, so it is nice to have a dedicated partnership and time to really bounce those ideas back off of each other, reflect upon what we're doing. Um, I learned so much from Lindsay, and Lindsay learned so much from me that we just thought, why reinvent the wheel? And we really need to make sure that if we're creating something about open pedagogy, that it is a partnership. It is not just a faculty member off on their own um, doing this together. So that's, it's really important to me um, 
that part of this program. Um, but I was part of the curriculum design team. Uh, I've been in since the beginning and um, reading the action plans at the end of the semester is easily one of my favorite parts of this course because the projects that come out of this, um, out of the two cohorts that we've already have, have been absolutely amazing, so. Thanks, Heather. Um, next, you will hear from uh, David Tully from North Carolina State University. Thank you, David. Thank you. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is David Tully. Um, as Tanya mentioned, I work at North Carolina State University Libraries. My job title is the Librarian for Student Success and Affordability. And um, I mean, I'll share with you that, you know, open education like has is just a really fundamental aspect of my role and has been for the past five years at least. Um, it speaks, I think, um, to my uh, key kind of professional professional interests in making learning just more affordable and more accessible for all of our students, regardless of their background. Um, and I've been fortunate to really witness um, firsthand just how open education can transform courses and inspire just really innovative pedagogies that promote things like collaboration and student learning, student agency, and um, just remove barriers and empower learners in, in lots of different fun and cool ways in helping to shape their own educational experiences. So to give you a little bit of an idea about some of my professional experience, I've been in my current position for the last two, three years, something along those lines, but I've been at NC State for a lot longer. I think this is my 12th year. So they're finding it hard to get rid of me. Um, in terms of open education, my most sort of pertinent experience began about five years ago. We have an alt, text, alt textbook project program that um, many of you will be familiar with, maybe under different names. It's, it's an OER grant program, essentially. Ours has been around for about 10 years now. So as part of that program, I sort of co-lead it with one or two other folks, but we lead a sort of much wider sort of university committee. And our focus there really is on securing, but also distributing grants to instructors, both um, to uh, adapt, adopt course materials that are free for students, but also to implement open enabled practices into their pedagogy. So again, open pedagogy. And we do things like um, provide support for publishing, um, guidance on copyright and fair use, dissemination, discovery, and all the other sort of fun and interesting things around, around sort of openness. It's been a really successful program. Um, I can't take any credit for the foundation of it because much like this program that we're talking about today, I um, others laid those foundations and did the hard yards and I joined it later um, and tried not to break anything, but it's been really successful, I will say. We've worked with all of our colleges at the university. We have 13 and most of the departments by this point, um, a couple of hundred instructors during that time. And we, it goes from strength to strength. This year, we're supporting 15 different courses that applied for grants. So it's really fun and interesting work. Alongside that, I co-lead the, the Open Pedagogy Incubator, which is similar-ish to the Certificate in Open Pedagogy that began back in 2020 as an NC State program. It's a faculty development program that really works with instructors to take them beyond the first step of open education, which is more around the course materials and bring them to a space uh, um, whereby they can um, make open interventions into their courses through assignments, through renewable assignments specifically. I've been fortunate enough um, to go on to, to now work in this program with Tanya and Heather and um, Abby and others. So as part of this program, I've taken on sort of more of a mentorship role. So I work now with one of the groups within, within the cohort and I help to facilitate their experience. So what that looks like in real terms is we've talked about the action plan already, which is developed throughout the program, both through that, but also through our sort of weekly discussions and every and everything else. Uh, I try and offer some guidance, some feedback, some some wisdom at times, maybe, maybe even some inspiration, and um, now and again an intervention, and essentially support folks who are part of my group on their journey throughout the program and use some of my experience and know-how sort of along the way. Um, 
I'll share with you quickly, as a relatively new facilitator to the program, one of the things that I think is just like particularly cool, apart from the duo aspect, which is completely unique and works a charm really, is the um, the fact that you get to meet and work alongside folks from all different parts of the, the country, essentially. So people from different types of institution, different levels of experience, different types of backgrounds. That's a huge strength of the program and probably the most enjoyable aspect that I found alongside the action plans, which are always fun, is just listening to those different perspectives and um, learning something new, but also also being able to share and be listened to as well. It really is a pretty fun experience that um, that we facilitate. Thanks, David. Um, next, we will get a chance uh, to hear from some of the alumni, um, some from the first offering and some from the second, uh, but I thought you all might benefit from hearing what their experiences is um, and how the program has benefited them. So we're going to start with Juanita Doan from Clark College. Thanks for being here, Juanita. My pleasure. Uh, so I'm, I teach uh, communication studies for Clark College, but I live at the farthest west point in my state, one of them anyway, on the coast. So I live three hours from my college campus and teach online. So uh, being connected with my librarian, I call her my librarian now, Katie, um, and working with people from around the country was one of the best parts of this program. Uh, I'm a education activist from way back, so anything open and accessible really entices me into it. Shortly before this program became available, I was in the first cohort, so shortly before it became available, we had gone to OER uh, textbooks in my course. Um, I teach interpersonal communication and now I'm also going to teach public speaking. So that was an added bonus to get to be part of this program just after we had adopted a open ed textbook and work on some other aspects of my own course. So I mentioned getting to know Katie, who I'd never met, who I've still never met in person, but we still work together uh, in my class, continue to work. This is this will be the third year now that we'll be working together. And she is embedded in my class now. Uh, so my project, our project was to transform one of my uh, assignments, which is the PowerPoint or we added a poster option to that, made it more uh, more options for students. And then we added a component where they take it and teach it to someone in their lives. We didn't make it, um, we didn't have them make it open resources. We didn't feel like that was something that we wanted to do with, uh, with students who were maybe first year students. So we have them take it and teach it to someone else. And then uh, we added in a, a, a module to my class where we teach students to use open education resources of graphics and photos. And we and Katie developed a page teaching them about different uh, resources there, which are also inclusive and um, maybe not your standard uh, clip art so that their projects are more inclusive. And then also teaching them to uh, caption those uh, photos in their PowerPoint so that they're uh, accessible. So I, one goal I've, I've had for a while is teaching students to make their projects accessible so that when they share them with fellow students, uh, they're universally designed. So that was one thing to get time with a librarian to work on that project was a gift. And so that continues to be part of my class as does the project. Now I'm designing a public speaking course, which I'm thinking about how to make those speeches uh, open and inclusive. And 
I'm going to design a module where, or a, a instructional piece where it teaches them to include closed captions on their speeches that they record. So, but overall, the the program was pos completely positive, enjoyable, um, and I can't recommend it highly enough. So thank you, all of you instructors too. Thanks, Juanita. Uh, it was very interesting to hear your perspective. Um, and thankfully, Kim Johnson from Minnesota State University at Mankato um, has joined us to share a little bit about her experience in the program as well. Thank you, Kim. Sure. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Okay, good. Um, so I was in the program, the OEM program last year, last academic year, and I had just returned um, midsummer before the school year started from a um, sabbatical where I spent the year in Sierra Leone, which is West Africa. And um, I became interested in any, in any and all things open while I was there because I encountered just um, not having access to anything and really starting to realize how people in other countries just don't have access. Um, and so um, when I, when I came back and was thinking about my classes and also continuing to support the programs that I helped to develop there, um, I was there to help develop programs in, in special education, which is a new field of study in the country. And um, so we, uh, when I came back, I'm, I'm still supporting all of those classes. I teach classes for them on Saturday mornings at 5 a.m. virtually when their power works and their internet works. Um, and, it, and it was a lot for me to figure out how to provide all the content for all those programs and also kind of ridiculous thinking that I could do such a thing and, and also ridiculous. Why should I try to do such a thing when there is there are so many other experts out there? I'm not the only one. Um, and so I really started looking for all any and all things open. And then this program um, was available and I was so happy um, to do this. I, I did mine with um, Jess Schomburg, librarian at, at Mankato, um, and she's brilliant. And we have, our program was about connecting my students in Sierra Leone with my students in um, the US. And so our project is an assignment where they collaborate on um, an instructional plan for children with reading disabilities. And my students here um, write, will be writing um, an instructional plan to teach something um, foundational reading related and trying to keep it kind of free of, um, I, I kind of refer to it as culturally open in addition to open related to um, materials and teaching supplies and things. Um, because in Sierra Leone, they just don't have much related to all of that. And so it's kind of a challenge for teachers here to think, how will I teach this lesson without all these things I'm used to having? Um, and then they're putting that out there. And then my students in Sierra Leone are looking at those and also thinking more about how they need to adjust it even more. And then just kind of sharing it back with the students here. So it kind of creates some really interesting discussions just related to cultural differences. Um, and, and bringing people together around just the idea of teaching kids with disabilities, which exist everywhere, and how do we do that um, to the best of our ability. And so um, we're, we're just getting started this semester with that um, collaborative project with the Sierra Leone students and my students here. Thanks, Kim. Um, I remember during the project symposium, just hearing about this cross-cultural experience like gave me goosebumps. Um, and if you think Kim's project is cool, like all of them have that same kind of flavor, like just so interesting, such a diverse array of, um, of disciplines and what they're doing with it. Um, all of them were were pretty inspiring. So um, the last alumnus uh, who's agreed to speak today is Sarah. Oh, let me change it on the screen. Sarah Evans from the University of Central Missouri. So thank you, Sarah, for being here. Yeah, thank you for having me. Um, I am lucky to go last because I can just echo that everything everyone said so far is completely true. Um, that collaborative aspect of this program really is the secret sauce. Um, so I'm from University of Central Missouri. I am a librarian, so I'm a liaison to the College of Education here. And I was actually approached to participate in this from um, a professor in our library science program. 
uh, Jenna Kammer, who is phenomenal to work with, um, and she wanted to explore more about OER, OEP, um, and knew that I didn't know anything about either of those things, but knew that I was always kind of game to, to try things. Um, and so I'm, I'm coming to you as someone who really didn't have a background in OER or OEP or quite understand what, what I was getting into. Um, and throughout this program, um, I have learned so much. Um, I've been so inspired. Um, the mentorship part aspect of the program um, Tanya's comments as we were struggling through our, our action plan and trying to figure out what it was we were doing and how it was going to work um, to the discussions um, from the other members of the cohort. You know, I really liked the style of having librarians and faculty reading uh, similar but, but different um, things each week and kind of bringing those into context. And the the style of that, coupled with uh, working with Jenna one on one on on this course redesign um, for her action research course, um, it was such a great learning environment. Um, and even though I felt co like a complete imposter most of the time I was uh, doing this, um, I feel like now on the other side, uh, I have such a great rich knowledge of of how all of this comes together and so many new ideas to bring to our university. Um, and we our university is not currently doing any kind of open educational initiatives. We don't have OER adoption. Uh, we we barely had an OER libguide um, for uh, for faculty who are interested. And now uh, we have the makings of one. Um, I'm doing workshops for other faculty who might be interested. Jenna and I have um, a whole bunch of new ideas for her course and I get to be embedded in her course. I've already recorded lectures on Creative Commons. Um, we made little zines. <laughs> I printed one. Um, so uh, just the whole aspect of it and all the different ways that you can incorporate open, open educational resources but also open pedagogy, um, both as faculty members and librarians in our instruction. Um, it's really been an eye-opening experience for me, um, and I can't wait to keep going. I really hope I can find another faculty who wants to take the course with me again, um, but uh, I'm definitely going to recommend it to my other uh, liaison librarians because it's such a great way to, to work really closely with faculty, get to know more about their needs, and share more about what librarians can do and how we can all work together to make um, these open educational initiatives uh, flourish on our campuses. So I loved it. You should do it. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, I don't think I could have said it better. Uh, as a matter of fact, I know I couldn't have. Uh, so thank you so much for sharing. Um, I, and there was a question in the chat earlier about like, is this an individual program? Do I, you know, do I have to be with a, a faculty partner or a librarian partner? It is structured for partners. So um, that's the only way we move through. But this year we're going to try, if we get, for instance, a librarian who doesn't have a faculty partner, we will try to match you with one. So we'll see how the mat matchmaking goes, uh, but it is ideal, absolutely, to have a faculty librarian or instructional designer, faculty adjac adjacent person at that institution. Then you're kind of working with the same constructs, the same uh, background, all of that. But if you can't, we are willing to try uh, to match you if, if we can. We don't know how many applications that will come in. We know that we can accept 50. Um, and so, you know, we know how many we can accept and we just have no idea how many are going to apply. So we are going to wait and see. Um, is the fee institution for each person? Yes, it's a per person fee. Sorry if that wasn't clear. Um, and we're happy to take any questions you might have, like the one that just came in the chat. Um, so it is, the fee is per, per person, per partner. That is correct. Um, but we'd love to take any of your questions and uh, alumni, instructors, please feel free to unmute and answer the questions as well. Applications are due October 25th, so you do have some time. Ariana, please feel free to unmute and ask a question. Yeah, hi. Um, I just have one question right now for clarification. I'm looking at the calendar for the program, um, which is the um, asynchronous online course in spring. 
and then um, implementing the projects in fall 2025. Um, there were, I think, some places in the call for applications and maybe in the FAQ document that mentioned implementing or piloting um, the action plan the following spring. Um, so I just want to clarify, I think that's meant to say the following fall. I just wanted to make sure I don't have any confusion around the timeline. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm not sure where it's wrong, but yeah, so so this, uh, the um, course is in the spring of 2025, you have the summer to kind of think about it, work on it if you need to still, and then you implement it in the following fall, uh, so that would still be the fall of 25. Uh, so sorry if, if that was wrong somewhere. So yeah, you we tried it, we have tried it the other way, offering it in the fall, then you teach in the spring. And what we heard was we needed more time to like think and to revise. And that's a lot of work and we needed time. So we adjusted accordingly. Um, and so the timeline is indeed the online course uh, starting in January, uh, you have a few weeks before you have the project symposium, then you have the rest of the spring and the summer to revise implementation ideally then in the following fall. Does that help Ariana? Yeah, and I really like that timeline of having more more time in the summer too. Um, though actually, would it like say a, a faculty member is teaching a course that isn't offered in the fall, but they're teaching it the following spring, that's fine too, right? Just whatever they next teach it. Yeah, it is fine. I think the only thing, and it's not like this is a deal breaker in no way is it, but you know, we kind of hope to say, okay, now you implement, we're going to survey you and connect with you. And now you're kind of done to go be. So if you haven't implemented yet, you just aren't able to answer those questions. But yes, that still works for us. Awesome. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Um. Trisha, it, may I, is it okay to ask your question publicly? Because you're not the only sure. one who's asked the question. Oh, sure. Yes. Okay. So because the OAN has done a lot lately on open pedagogy, there's multiple things flying around there. So um, the question is, how is this program different from the open pedagogy learning circle curriculum? Just to be super clear, the Open Pedagogy Learning Circle is something we offer in the fall and the spring, created by Amanda Larson um, and then uh, taken by us. Um, she was our faculty fellow. It is a seven week long program where faculty members create um, you know, uh, some type of resource um, or, you know, they they revise some type of artifact and um, it is not intended to necessarily be curricular redesign. It is not a partner program. It is certainly not a year. It is a seven week long program. So really the open pedagogy learning circles is if you want to dip your toe in in the pool of open pedagogy, but you just don't have the time to commit to a long curricular revision and it is not partner focused. So it's a short and sweet experience and then it's done. Um, so this is quite different. Um, for anyone who might have a question of, wait, but you have another certificate program. That's for librarians only. And it's really about open education resources and practices. It's not specifically about curricular revision. So sorry if it's unclear. I think what we're going to start doing is just to market everything side by side so everybody can just kind of see, oh, this is what learning circles are. So I apologize if you are at all confused. If you have any other questions about that, let me know. Trisha, did that help? Sorry, yes, it totally did. Thank you. Oh, and you didn't want to double dip. You're welcome to double dip. And Trisha and, and Melissa um, uh, are part of our open uh, pedagogy community of practice. That is another opportunity that we will be publicizing soon. If you want to get together with a, a bunch of fellow practitioners, to just talk about challenges, benefits, something you're thinking about. It's been, for me, wonderful to get together with fellow practitioners uh, doing the same kinds of things that I'm doing and thinking about doing. So uh, that is also something uh, that we'll be publicizing soon. We are a fun group. I agree. And Trisha is really kind of the most fun. <laughs> Melissa, the group is easily the most welcoming, informed, collegial. Oh, that's so nice. And that's where I got to know Melissa and then recruited her with her instructional design background to be one of our instructors. So that was awesome. Um, any other questions 
about this program or applying? Tanya, there's a new question in the chat. Okay. Um, oh. Is it possible to have two librarians paired with a faculty member? Like if a librarian kind of wants to come along the journey with them. Um... Good question. So Heather, you 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 artfully paused. <laughs> do you have an answer? Or do you want me to take it? <laughs> I do not have an answer. <laughs> okay, so. We have talked about a librarian taking on two faculty members. Um, it, it's not like, you know, only one pays. We still would expect everyone to pay, but we have not really, Ariana, explored the possibility of two librarians with one faculty member. Um, I think we're open to that um, because why wouldn't we try it? This is the first time that is not grant funded. Um, and so, to that question, I think we would consider it if that's something that was best for your institution. So I don't know why we would say no to that. Um, and maybe saying yes would show us that there's a better way to do it. So I think the I think the answer is yes, we would consider it. Um, NID, yes, too. Yes, and just to be clear, if I keep saying librarian, um, it's because we've only worked with librarians and faculty, but now we are opening it up to instructional designers and those people who feel like they have the ability to redesign curriculum and be a thoughtful contributor to that experience as an instructional designer would 100% be. Um, so pardon me if I've, if I've repeatedly said librarian. Good. I'm so glad, Donna. Thank you. Any final questions before we wrap up? Okay, then thank you so much for those of you. Oh, somebody raised her hand. So before I wrap up, Manisha, would you do you have a question? I want to say this session has been fantastic. Um, Tanya, you may not know, but um, I've reconnected with two people in this group and chat they sent. And um, I received two excellent sources about public speaking, open education resources. You know, so <laughs> thank you so much. Not only listening to your story, you know, the process. Uh, I think you, you must publish a OER about this process, you know, like uh, videos, because orality is so important. Uh, if somebody would like, I'd love to interview you more because I'm interested in this program. And, you know, as a mature learner, it's always good to build connections um, because we all are putting in our time. Uh, I'd like to, if it's okay, and if Tanya is sending, um, you know, has, has the permission to send your emails and somebody is willing to have a conversation with me, I'd like to know a little bit more uh, because I'm really interested. I'm doing my doctorate degree in um, uh, online education through Athabasca University. And this is my area of interest, you know, open education, open pedagogy, and uh, OERs, indigenous OERs. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And we are, a, a group of us um, are writing something and to feasibly submit it to a journal someday. <laughs> so we are, uh, that is in the works to share this experience because it has been a remarkable and unique one. So thank you. Um, and please feel free uh, to email me if you have further questions. Uh, thanks again for everyone who spoke and who, who attended. We hope to see your applications in the coming day. So have a great rest of your day and, and weekend ahead. Bye, everyone. Thank you.